join our rocking chairs towards a wish and plant our dreams where the peaceful river flows. Whoa, where the green grass grows. everybody and welcome to our webinar today. We're so glad to have you join us on this Friday for the first of many webinars to come on Fridays at noon. And for those of you who are also Tim McGraw fans, he brings me back to my days at Iowa State and it was just a fitting song. I am led today by Amy Lentz from Weld County moving to Boulder County next week and then our host and the presenter is Tony Kosky. Before we get started, I just wanted to give you a couple reminders. The first is that Amy will put our upcoming webinars into the chat so you can sign up for any of those. They are free. We would love for you to attend any of our upcoming webinars and please register because if you do, you will then receive the recording for that as well as any handouts. We will also be recording this and posting it onto that same blog site. Just scroll a little bit further down. Um, if you have questions, we're in a different format. If you've joined us before, we're in the webinar format. So ask all of your questions in the Q&A. We will actually be turning off the chat during the presentation. So any Q&As that you have on the bottom or top of your screen, just open that up and you can ask us any questions at that time. And I just want to briefly introduce you to Extension. If you're not familiar with who we are, we are your outreach arm of Colorado State University, your land grant institution here in Colorado. And what we do is we provide you with information that you can use every day. So whether you need food preservation or food safety information, maybe you were a 4-H'er or your child is a 4-H'er, we have information that you can use. And all of these webinars, of course, are focused on gardening and helping preserve our natural resources. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to Dr. Tony Kosky, who is going to be leading us in our presentation today on Convert Your Turf, because as we face water shortages and people just may not want a typical lawn, he'll take you through those steps. So thanks for joining us today, Tony, and you can take it away. Cool. Thanks, everyone, for uh, being here. Thanks, Allison and Amy, for helping host this. Um, so we're going to talk about converting turf. Um, I think some of the promo uh, material that maybe you saw on Instagram, I, I kind of suggested this would be if you wanted to convert your turf to a garden or something. And that would just be the killing the part of the turf. But I think probably a lot of people are on here to uh, maybe uh, learn about how you might convert your bluegrass lawn to perhaps a buffalo grass lawn, something like that. But if you want to convert it to something else, if you want to turn it into a, a rock garden or a vegetable garden or something like that, um, when we get to the part about killing the turf, you'll probably be interested in that part of it. So, um, so this is mainly going to be talking about how do you change from one kind of grass to another. So one thing I always like to start out my my talks about lawns with and is is uh, to to remind people that 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 lawns do uh, provide a lot of uh, environmental services and benefits uh, uh, to uh, us as individuals to the environment to our communities um, you know they're comprised of plants that photosynthesize and they transpire so they cool the environment um, uh, lawns fix. Uh, uh, carbon dioxide, they actually take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So uh, for those of you that, that think about and are concerned about uh, rising carbon dioxide levels, um, lawns are one way of, of battling it. it. It's not just, not just forests and, and that type of thing. Um, and uh, uh, so from, from that perspective, uh, managing a healthy lawn can help, help uh, offset your own personal carbon footprint. Um, lawns, people say lawns aren't very diverse, and that might be true from a maybe a plant perspective. You might have 100% bluegrass or 100% tall pesky lawn or even 100% buffalo grass lawn. 
but that doesn't mean there isn't a lot of diversity in the soil uh, in the insects, uh, the little tiny critters that most of us don't see or think about in that system. Um, the soil can be very, very diverse in uh, yeah, any type of a lawn. You know, turf is probably the most effective plan of preventing uh, soil erosion. Um, and so when we have floods and that type of thing, uh, the turf and grasses are very effective at keeping that soil in place. Um, you know, from a, a fire perspective, we've been having a lot of conversations in extension about this, but green lawns don't burn very well. Um, and so from that perspective, uh, they could provide you know, some of that defensible area around a, a home if you are living in, in places where, where fire might be a concern. Then, of course, it's a great place to play if you're a, a kid or a dog or even an adult. Um, and uh, it's good exercise taking care of your lawn, pushing that lawn more. And if you like to hand weed or whatever the case might be, uh, just physically and mentally uh, taking care of your lawn can be can be a healthy thing. So uh, and then finally, there is that aesthetic part of it. Uh, you know, lawns can look nice. And so. Uh, uh, there's there's lots of benefits that lawns provide to society. I had to put this picture in. I was I was talking to my son, who I don't know. He travels all over the world. He went from Fiji and then he went to the Grand Canyon camping, and now he's somewhere down in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and uh, so he was telling me about this friend he was visiting, and he says, "Yeah, they got this synthetic turf all over the place around their house." He says, "But I was walking around on it." And he says, there's sprinkler heads in this artificial turf. And he, he was asking me why that was. And I said, it's because that synthetic turf is way too hot to walk on um, during most of the time in Phoenix, at least during the day. And why is that? Because synthetic turf can't cool itself. It doesn't transpire like, like turf does. So uh, I had his, uh, his uh, girlfriend, I think those are her feet there. She sent me a picture of this uh, synthetic lawn with the, with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, irrigation head in it and and kind of a quote from the uh, the, the owners that's they, they like not having to mow it but it is so hot to walk on that they can't basically use their their lawn during the day they do it uh, in the evening or early morning um, from simply from a, a water perspective and I think that's a lot of reasons that people want to maybe change from bluegrass to something else. There's this concern that maybe they're using too much water on their lawns um, or that lawns are a water hog and that they use half the water in the state. You hear all kinds of uh, myths and misinformation about how much water uh, lawns uh, and golf courses and parks and those, those type of areas use. Um, but when you look at whole uh, landscape water use, and this, this is a paper that uh, Allison and uh, Zach Johnson, uh, one of our faculty members in our department, and I, we worked on this, I don't know, probably six or seven years ago, maybe a little longer than that. But we looked at um, uh, all these benefits that landscapes, irrigated landscapes provide to us in our lives and our, our environment. And part of that, uh, that document, if you just Google um, hidden value of landscapes, this document will come up. We didn't print any, it's all electronic. Um, but uh, landscapes, irrigated landscapes in Colorado use about 3% of the water, of all the water used for every purpose in the state of Colorado. Um, and so we think that the, the payback, what you would get from those irrigated landscapes is, is, is worth that 3%. So um, does that mean that we shouldn't try to make that 2%? Uh, and I think all of us would agree if we can get that number down to two or even 1%, and still have beautiful landscapes, that's uh, something worth striving for. So um, uh, not a lot of water is used to maintain our landscapes, but it's the water that we see being used. We don't live on, on farms, most of us, and that's where most of the water in the state is used, by the way, somewhere, oh, roughly 85 to 90% of all the water used for every purpose in the state of Colorado is used for agriculture. So we don't wanna compete with those folks for water. We want to leave more for them because they're producing our food, but uh, uh, certainly we believe that the amount of uh, or the, the value that we get by investing that three percent of water is uh, it's it, it's good value um, and it's 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 important value um, uh, for that water investment. 
I also wanted to show you this. Uh, this somebody sent me this uh, also this morning. So I, I decided to put this in that uh, uh, the Harris uh, poll folks, uh, they did a survey of uh, uh, homeowners. And uh, uh, one of the, the interesting things that came out of this is that 76% uh, of people said that their yard space is one of the most important parts of their home. Um, and this was, uh, they kind of looked at pre-COVID and after COVID and, uh, but homeowner love of their yards, and that's not just their lawns, it's the flowers and the trees and everything that goes in that landscape uh, increased because people were spending uh, time. But now, once we're, I, I guess, hopefully out of the COVID stuff, um, a vast majority say that they plan, 84% plan to invest in their yard in 2022. Um, and so uh, one, one area is that 40% solo, they're going to do things to maintain or improve the grassy areas of their landscape. So, so maybe you are among those, those 40% uh, uh, covered in that, um, in that poll. And interestingly, this poll was con commissioned by this uh, foundation called the Turf Mutt Foundation. Um, this is an interesting group. Uh, you can just Google them, turfmutt.com. Um, and what they do is they promote um, uh, kids' activities in landscapes. They promote uh, uh, use of best management practice for lawns and trees and that type of thing. So it's a, it's a whole landscape thing. It's not just you know, kind of lawn oriented, but they've got CEOs of Toro and Jacobson and, and uh, Still and all these big manufacturers are on this board uh, to promote a healthy, healthy landscape. So look up Turf Mutt and their spokes, their spokes person, if you will, is, uh, is a shelter dog. So fun uh, of website to go to and also very informational. Um, okay, so this is might be what some of you are looking to do. Here's an example from uh, Fort Collins, where there's something called the Zero Escape Incentive Program. We call it the ZIP program. This has been going for a number of years where homeowners that want to convert from kind of a, a, a very plain, uh, boring kind of a landscape with just a bunch of bluegrass and nothing much else there to something that's a little more water conserving, a little more interesting, maybe more pollinator friendly. Uh, there's a program here in Fort Collins. Uh, Greeley has something similar. Uh, I'm not sure about other <clears throat> municipalities, wherever you folks are living, but I would check with your water conservation departments, wherever you're listening from, to see if they have a similar program to help offset the cost of doing this conversion. So here's a simple before and after of one of these uh, landscapes that was converted um, in the uh, uh, Fort Collins ZIP program. So that's really what kind of thing, you know, I'm gonna be talking about is how do you go from maybe a grass you don't like very much, maybe it's a lawn that doesn't look very good, maybe you have bigger goals of having a native landscape. There's all kinds of reasons that people want to uh, uh, convert their lawns. Just, just a couple more pictures of, of lawn conversions. It may just be that your lawn looks horrible, and you want it to look better. Um, you know, I, I helped Allison do that through what her lawn uh, quite a few uh, uh, years ago. She went from a, a very uh, clumpy, ugly, tall fescue lawn to, and this is not her house. She probably wishes it was, um, but she's got a nice house too. But her lawn looks like that one now, and that's kind of what it looked like before. So uh, maybe that's why you're listening. And so, so whatever the reason, what we're going to talk about is is how you go from this conversion. Now, something I would warn you that if you do want to convert from lawn to something that's a little more natural, something you don't want to mow, something that might look like this, uh, make sure that you inform the city wherever you're living um, uh, that um, uh, what you're going to do, what you plan uh, doesn't violate any kind of city uh, uh, rules and regulations about height and what you can do, like kind of what we affectionately call the hell strip area, um, or check with your HOA to make sure you're doing things that aren't going to get you in trouble. Um, because it's that certainly, certainly you don't want to spend a lot of money doing something and then have your city or your HOA or whatever come on and say, well, you really can't do that, or you have to keep it shorter than that, or whatever the case might be. 
Um, and just speaking of HOA, it's a lot of things that people think their HOA can't or won't allow them to do uh, really has been superseded by state law. Um, so if they tell you you can't change your bluegrass to buffalo grass, they are absolutely wrong and they cannot prevent you from doing something like that. So they can't prevent you from putting synthetic turf in though, so, which I think is a good thing. Um, but in any case, check with your HOA in your city to make sure what you're planning on doing um, doesn't violate any of those covenants. Um, so some things that are really important to think about in this conversion process, you know, what are you gonna change to? What are you, what kind of grass are you gonna move to from bluegrass to what? Um, and that's an important decision to make because if you have a very shady lawn, buffalo grass is not gonna do well in shade. So make sure that you're gonna put the right plant in the right situation. Um, if you have a real busy lawn, you probably actually, to be honest, should probably stick with, with uh, bluegrass, but I'll show you something you might be able to change it to. Um, and you should consider the time, uh, the, the time of year you have to do this. Uh, buffalo grass, you have to start in the spring. You just have to. If you wait until the fall to do it, your buffalo grass is probably going to die over the winter. So there are certain times that certain grasses should be um, uh, converted to, uh, better times than other times. Um, the cost of conversion can be expensive, both in time and dollars. And if you're hiring someone, uh, just the cost of seed. I've seen buffalo grass seed going for like $60 a pound now because there's a shortage of seed. Uh, most, most grass seeds actually. Um, so uh, uh, that's something to consider. Can you even get what you want? Can you find the seed that you want? Can you find the sod? Maybe you're going to use, you want to convert using sod. You better visit with some sod growers to make sure that what you want to move to, you can actually, you can actually buy. Um, you know, what's your patience level? How quickly does this have to happen? Um, you know, the whole site preparation thing. Uh, you know, if you don't like using Roundup, and we're not going to change, turn this into a Roundup debate, but I'm going to show you how to use Roundup. And it's probably the smartest, even if you just want to use Roundup one time in your life and never again, doing your lawn conversion is the time to do it. Um, you know, you're going to have weeds. So unless you sod, if you seed, if you plug, if you do sprigs, whatever other way you change uh, or, or use to establish a new lawn, you're going to have weeds growing in it. So you have to be aware of that and you have to have a plan in place. Uh, we're not going to talk about the ongoing maintenance or care, but uh, that's obviously something to consider. So, so yeah, here's the part, this is the lower picture. This is the part that a lot of times you don't get in talks like this. People just say, oh yeah, it's easy to convert from bluegrass to buffalo grass. It's painless, nothing bad will happen. This is what's gonna happen. I can absolutely guarantee you, you will have weed problems. 100%, I promise you will have weed problems. Um, some people will have more severe weed problems than others. I'm gonna talk about how you might minimize those weed problems. So, so this is kind of that reality check. It's not gonna be cheap, it's not gonna be quick, it's not gonna be easy, but it could be worthwhile in the end. So, so do your homework uh, beforehand. So what do you, what, uh, what are we going to change to? Um, you know, again, a lot of the reason is to save water. It's certainly certain grasses um, can give you a fairly nice looking lawn with relatively little water. Um, you know, I'm just going to put a plug in here for, for bluegrass that gets beat up all the time in this regard. Uh, the bluegrass doesn't turn the water spigot on and off. It doesn't turn, it doesn't control the irrigation clock. And I will tell you by far, most people overwater their bluegrass lawns. And that, that can be an, actually a really good shortcut to this whole water saving thing is just start turning your irrigation clock back from running from 20 minutes a set to 19 to 18 to 15 and see how far you can cut it back without it, uh, you starting to see uh, brown spots developing. And you'd be surprised at really how much little or how little water you can apply to a bluegrass lawn and keep it looking nice. But certainly buffalo grass, blue grama, Bermuda grass, I'll talk about a little bit, can give you a very good lawn with a lot less water than, say, uh, blue grass or even tall fescue uh, lawns can. So, and they all can look really nice. Um, or you can have a, a buffalo grass lawn that you don't ever water at all. Here's, here's, here's an example of one. Uh, I took this picture in four counts. Somebody converted from a blue grass lawn to a buffalo grass lawn. They never water it, they never fertilize it, they only mow it once or twice a year. And that's kind of what it looks like. Now, some people say 
that's cool with me. Other people say, no, nah, I need it a little greener. So be realistic in your expectations. Do your homework to make sure that uh, what you're getting into is something you're going to be happy with at the end because there's going to be a lot of work, quite honestly, doing, doing these conversions. If you never water, this is what things can look like. So I don't usually do this publicly, but this is the backyard of my house. Uh, very few people have seen this because I live so far north of town. Um, you know, if you're familiar with the uh, northern front range right up here, I think you can see my pointer here. Those hills there, that's something that's called the Cheyenne Ridge. Um, and you'll actually you'll be hearing about the Cheyenne Ridge. If you're a weather geek coming up, we have a potential big snowstorm coming Monday. If everything sets up right, it'll all be because of the Cheyenne Ridge or part of it and the way wind flows off of that. Um, but in any case, it's very dry where I live. Um, you know, whereas in Fort Collins, they'll get in a normal year, maybe 15 or 16 inches of total precipitation a year. At my house, I'm lucky to get 12. Um, so this shows my lawn that has not been irrigated ever in the history of that lawn, ever in 30, and I lived there 30, what, 34 years now, something like that. And that's what my blue grandma wheatgrass lawn looks like. There is actually more soil than lawn there. Uh, but it's the last thing I want to take care of when I go home. Um, so could I have a great lawn? I could, but it's not something high on my priority list. Um, and here, this is here, this is the Cheyenne Ridge, even closer right here. This is native uh, buffalo grass, and and that's what it looks like if it never nobody ever irrigates it. So, you know, you can plant buffalo grass, and if you never, never, ever, ever irrigate it, it's not going to probably look real pretty. So just keep that in mind that even buffalo grass, if you want it to have some semblance of a lawn, you're probably gonna have to irrigate it more than what it's getting right here. And that's native buffalo grass, only watered by mother nature. So, so keep that in mind. Most lawns are gonna need some level of water if you want them to look like a lawn. So now some people wanna do true natives. So the, the, the native thing is really, really important to them. Um, and this is really a list of the natives, the true native plants that you could put in the lawn in Colorado. Of these, the ones that are probably going to give you the, the most lawn-like look are the is buffalo grass um, and blue grama, maybe in combination, maybe wheatgrass, maybe. I put fine fescues in here. They're really not native. But most of these are very clumpy and bunchy grasses, and they're they're going to look like my backyard. My backyard's got western wheatgrass, and then blue grama, and never irrigated. It's not going to look very pretty. So you got to be realistic in your in your expectations. So uh, so you know buffalo grass. Let's go through these quickly. Buffalo grass is native to Colorado. It's it, it can make a beautiful lawn. This is one that's quite frankly probably irrigated like it's a bluegrass lawn which kind of defeats the purpose maybe of having buffalo grass there, but it was gorgeous, absolutely stunning buffalo grass lawn, probably irrigated way more than it needs to be. Um, you know, so it's a, it's, it's a great, you know, replacement for bluegrass. The only problem is if you've got a lot of traffic, if you've got those two or three big dogs or lots of kids and a small backyard, you don't want to be putting buffalo grass back there, but maybe in the front yard where it gets a lot less traffic. So it just can't take that constant pounding of dogs and kids and that type of thing. So um, uh, it, it truly is an option. Here's just another buffalo grass lawn. Again, gorgeous, probably irrigated way, way, way more than it needs to be. Um, but yet, you know, it's a native lawn. And, and uh, you know, in my mind, if you're put it, <laughs> replacing bluegrass with this and you're irrigating it the same as you did the bluegrass, um, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me why you did that conversion, but uh, that's what that's what was happening here. This is probably a more realistic buffalo grass lawn, and the reason that people would do it. And again, this is how that house I showed you a picture of before. So yes, the color is not perfect. Um, this is towards the end of summer, so this has been a whole summer without any irrigation. Um, you can tell it hasn't been mowed, so it's tall. It hasn't been fertilized. You know, so could you make this lawn look? This buffalo grass look like that buffalo grass? Yep. And in fact, 
these these varieties are very close cousins of each other. These are these are very close to one another. Um, and so you can make this one look like that pretty one with mowing and water. So uh, if you are going to do buffalo grass, there are certain varieties that do better in Colorado. Um, and there's some that don't do well at all. So buffalo grasses that grown in Texas don't do well in Colorado. So there's one grown a lot in the southern part of the United States called 609. You can buy this one online. I would not buy this and plant it in Colorado because it'll you'll get about 50% winter kill every winter here. But all these other ones, these the seeded ones, these these others that you can get as plugs um, are very winter hardy here in Colorado and can give you a pretty darn nice lawn. Something that's interesting about buffalo grass is that it has male and female plants. So the males produce these flowers, that's where the pollen comes. If you're allergic, um, that can be a consideration. Then the female produces the seed. Now, if you keep the males away from the females, they'll still produce what we call empty seed, empty florets. There's no viable seed in here, but there's no pollen. So if you are allergic to uh, uh, maybe buffalo grass pollen or just grass pollen in general, it might be nice to have a female only buffalo grass lawn, uh, which you can do. Um, so uh, some of the buffalo grasses um, sold are female only. Now, if you if it's only the female and it's not producing seed, obviously the only way to plant it is by what we call vegetative means. And, and so they sell these plug trays with these little individual plugs of buffalo grass. You stick them in the ground and they spread because buffalo grass spreads by runners. And so that's a way to start a buffalo grass lawn and to keep the males out of it. So I'll show you more pictures of that in a few minutes of how to establish a buffalo grass lawn. Uh, blue grama is another alternative. Uh, quite frankly, I think blue grama looks way better if you don't mow it than if you do mow it. Um, when you do mow it, it tends to be, look very clumpy. When you don't mow it, you get the beautiful seed heads and it doesn't look as bunchy, but um, uh, certainly that's that's a, a personal choice whether you decide to uh, to uh, mow or not mow your your blue grama lawn. Uh, here's a picture of a wheatgrass lawn that that is irrigated, um, but you can see it just never gets really thick. You can always kind of see soil, okay, and that's a couple of golf balls in that in that wheatgrass. So um, it's not going to give you a bluegrass lawn look, but it'll give you kind of a lawn look. So. Um, so just giving you some pictures. Um, what about non-native alternatives to bluegrass? So you, you want to get rid of your bluegrass, but you want to switch to something else. So there is a, a, a hybrid, what, something we call Texas bluegrass hybrid, which is a cross between Texas bluegrass, a true native bluegrass grown, it grows in the panhandle of Texas, and they've crossed it with Kentucky bluegrass to make it look prettier. And this is a Texas bluegrass lawn. Then we have fescues, uh, we have Bermuda grass that we could put in lawns and even uh, crested wheatgrass. But again, my lawn was crested wheatgrass. So if you don't like that look, you probably wanna take that one off the list. But all of these are non-native alternatives. So Texas, uh, the Kentucky-Texas hybrid, you can get seed for it, you can get sod for, from it or for it from all along the front range. A lot of sod growers grow this one, this SPF 30 is a popular one with sod growers and a lot of uh, seed so, uh, that's so sold is uh, SPF 30. Gets a lot of rhizomes um, and that's what allows it to be very drought and uh, heat tolerant. Tall fescue is another good option, can give you a really nice lawn. Most people don't know, can't tell the good tall fescues from bluegrass now. Um, it can get really deep roots. So here's a bluegrass lawn with a clump of tall fescue growing in it. So it can give you great short-term drought resistance. Here's a problem is when it runs out of water, when it runs out of water, um, that plant will die. Whereas the bluegrass has gone dormant growing around it. So if we have long-term watering restrictions and you've converted to a tall fescue lawn, uh, there's a good chance that a, a large portion of that tall fescue lawn would, draw, would die. Uh, because it doesn't have a good dormancy mechanism. Whereas bluegrass, you can have bluegrass that you don't water for a couple of years and start watering again, it'll come back. So it's got much better drought resistance than 
than uh, tall fescue does. Then we have what we call the fine fescues. These are better if you've got a shady lawn that's not doing well uh, because the bluegrass doesn't like shade. This is the grass that you want to convert your, your shady lawn to. Um, here you can see uh, fine fescue growing in this, this kind of this hell strip area. Um, but it'll grow well in the sun too. So here's, uh, this is just a couple of miles south of my house. Uh, this is a fine fescue lawn, a chewing fescue, uh, and uh, just a beautiful lawn. And that lawn can probably uh, be watered about once every two weeks and stay pretty darn green um, and look really nice. So fine fescues are an underutilized grass uh, in, in, my, in my estimation. Something else you probably heard of is dog tough grass. This is a Bermuda grass. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a, actually, it's an African Bermuda grass. And it's uh, uh, contrary to this ad, I don't like this ad. It says similar to buffalo grass. It is not similar to all the buffalo grass. It's totally different species, don't different growth characteristics. And the only way it's similar is that it's a warm season grass. So it goes dormant with the first frost in the fall and it doesn't green up till sometime probably mid to late May. So you've got a very short gr um, green season with uh, uh, buffalo grass or dog tough grass. Um, but the, the buffalo grasses in general, it can be very drought resistant, uh, very wear tolerant. Um, one of my pictures is, oh, there it is. Okay. Um, and here's some pictures of, of dog tough grass. Um, uh, here's where it was plugged, and this is what it turns into. Um, something about dog tough, though, and I think it, this part is downplayed. Um, the, any any kind of Bermuda grass, any kind of Bermuda grass, and dog tough is a Bermuda grass is potentially invasive. You can kind of see in this picture how the stolons are creeping out onto the concrete. So this is a great place to, if you're going to grow Bermuda grass to keep it from invading other places. Uh, but that's why that's that's how you can plant it. You can plant it with these plugs, just like buffalo grass, and it'll grow and spread in one summer and cover all that bare soil over. But that spreading capability and potential makes it potentially a weed in, in your landscapes as well. It'll grow into your vegetable garden, in your flower beds and other places. So you kind of have to watch it to make sure uh, where it grows and where to keep it from growing. There are other Bermuda grasses that can do really well in Colorado. And in fact, in my estimation, even though uh, dog tough is a plant select plant, we're supposed to promote that because it's a CSU program. There are better Bermuda grasses for home lawns. Um, so the seeded ones, uh, Riviera and Yukon. Uh, here's a Riviera Bermuda grass lawn, very nice. Then there are vegetative ones. So just kind of like with a, a, a buffalo grass, um, there are certain Bermuda grasses that you cannot get seed for. Uh, Tahoma is a, is a one that you can only get sod or sprigs or plugs for. Same thing with uh, one called Iron Cutter. And both the Tahoma is being grown by sod growers in Colorado and now Green Valley sod um, down in Platteville is growing Tahoma. And they're going to be planting Iron Cutter uh, as well this year. And they are absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous uh, uh, buffalo grasses. This is one called Riviera which is a very beautiful one. Now she had some picture I took from my lawn, my front lawn, uh, when at a time when I did water it a little bit. Uh, but here's Tahoma 31. This is from uh, Platteville uh, from the sod farm. And this, is, this had been grown from sprigs. And this is probably about three weeks after they sprigged it. And then this is a few weeks after that. So um, it's an absolutely gorgeous grass and it hardly ever needs mowing. It just stays very, very short. Um, he only had to mow this a couple of times during the, the summer in Platteville last year. So very low growing. Here's just another view of this. Uh, when I visited uh, that side farm in August last year, that's kind of the, the worm's eye view of that, uh, of that grass. It's, it's just, it's a, a, an absolutely gorgeous, beautiful grass. It's hard, it's hard to believe it's a, it's a grass is how beautiful it is. And he's going to be selling some of that to Homa this year. So where do you get this stuff? Where do you where do you go to, to look at these different sods? Um, go to the go to the Rocky Mountain Sod Growers Association sodgrowers.com and then click on these. So um, uh, Green Valley, where's Green Valley on here? Somewhere. There's too many greens. 
uh, right here. So Green Valley, you could click on their website and, and they'll show you pictures of their Bermuda grass and their tall fescue and their, their hybrid, uh, their bluegrass hybrid, uh, uh, Texas hybrid. So, and so some of these sell buffalo grass. Well, actually Green Valley is the only one that sells buffalo grass now. So, um, so if you're going to sod, um, you know, find a good sod farm. If you want to seed, go to a legitimate seed company. Don't go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy your grass seed. Worst places to buy grass seed. But go to a, an actual uh, seed producer or a seed company, uh, Arkansas Valley, they're in Denver, Pawnee Buttes is in Greeley, uh, Buffalo Brand is in Greeley, uh, Southwest Seeds, if you're from the southwestern part of uh, Colorado, uh, from Dolores, they sell legitimate, good quality turf grass seed. Um, they'll sell you buffalo grass seed and blue grama and the, and the good the good Bermudas and all that type of thing. Uh, but they're going to sell you seed that the Lowe's or Home Depots don't even know exists. So do your homework, go to a good seed company or go to a garden center that has aligned themselves with, with these companies or to a farmer's co-op. Okay, so so uh, uh, so for, for example, Jack's uh, outdoor in uh, here in Colorado or in Fort Collins, Jackson, Loveland, et cetera, they sell Pawnee Buttes a seed in their store. So they get their seed from Pawnee Buttes so you don't have to go to, to Greeley. Um, so there's different ways to, uh, to get access to this good quality seed. You know, when you're converting your landscape, if you're going to convert one to something that doesn't uh, uh, require as much water, Remember that the trees growing in that landscape still need water. So here's some pictures of where conversions were being done. Um, and the idea was let's not water this bluegrass anymore. The problem is they forgot about the trees growing in those landscapes. So trees get their water from your lawn irrigation. That's where they get their water. It doesn't magically appear um, under your lawn. Um, so if you've got lindens, if you've got maples, if you've got you know the crab apples um, that are very drought sensitive, and you stop watering that lawn, they are going to suffer. They will decline. They will get disease. They will slowly over time start to decline and maybe eventually die if you don't provide some other way of watering them. And just putting a hose at the base of the tree when you remember to do it is not the way to water those plants. So this is a huge consideration especially for HOAs that are doing conversions. And to show you how quickly this can happen, these are linden trees. This is right on campus behind our building. And there was some heads, a few heads just went bad a couple summers ago. And this linden, which was not close enough to where the other irrigation was going, look what happened to this linden tree, just within a few weeks of that head going bad. So some trees are extremely sensitive once you start turning the water off on them. Now, certainly like a bur oak, it, um, you know, pinion pines, uh, you, know, pl uh, you know, species that are much more drought resistant and used to drier soils, they're not gonna react the same way. But unfortunately, most of the trees that we've been planting in our landscapes for years are higher water, less drought resistant trees. So keep that in mind when you're doing these conversions. So. Here's a smart way to do it. Okay, where the trees are, we're not gonna convert. We're gonna keep watering that, even though you may say that's a stupid place to have irrigated turf. I would probably agree with you. However, these trees are dependent on that irrigation, okay? Now, a way to do that is what they did in Greeley. I'll show you some conversion picks here. All right, let's go to this one. They put drip irrigation in for all the trees that they, so they converted these strips from bluegrass to buffalo grass, but then they put drip irrigation in for the trees. Okay, and they're, they're turning color because I took this picture in the fall, not because the trees are declining. So, so that is a way to, to help those trees to survive even though the turf area won't be irrigated as usual. Okay, let me show you, take you through the process here of you've decided what kind of grass you're going to plant. It could be buffalo grass seed, plugs. It could be changing from bluegrass to tall fescue or fine fescue, whatever you're changing into. The thing is you have to kill that existing lawn, okay? So I'm going to show you some ways of doing this. 
And these are basically, they're, they're involving Roundup. So I'm not gonna apologize about this. This is the way to do it. This is the easiest, the cheapest, the most sensible. It's environmentally friendly. Uh, if you don't like me saying that, send me nasty grams afterwards. I'll answer them. Um, but this is this is where you do use Roundup. And you want to make sure that that lawn is dead before you do the conversion. Otherwise, you're going to have the bluegrass coming back. And we're talking two or three applications of Roundup, each spaced about two, maybe three weeks apart. So you have to do your planning. You have to do a lot of upfront stuff before you even start putting the grass seed or the plugs in the ground here. But I'm showing you a, a process. I worked with a school teacher, Allison and I worked with a school teacher, oh man, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, I can't remember. Um, and he wanted to convert his, his bluegrass lawn to buffalo grass. And he promised to follow all the instructions and he did because he was a teacher. He followed the rules and he ended up with a gorgeous buffalo grass lawn. So first point was kill it with Roundup. Multiple applications. This is before his second application. So, so he started this this process. I think in in June, if I recall, uh, got the lawn all killed. Now the problem with this lawn it was it was very thatchy. There was a lot of organic matter. You don't want to be planting seed into that. So he did have to remove that. I'll show you a process later where you don't take the old lawn off. If there's not a, a too much organic matter, just leave that lawn in place and seed into it or plug into it. But this was too much organic layer and he had to remove it. So he removed it, um, he aerified them, um, made lots and lots and lots of holes. You can see, put flags out where his irrigation heads were so he didn't hit with his, uh, with his air fire. And the whole point of the aerifying is to loosen the soil, um, let them level it a little bit, but also those all those holes are great places for the buffalo grass seed to fall into and start growing. So then he seeded the lawn, then he rolled the lawn with a very heavy roller. This presses any seed that didn't fall in the hole, it pressed it into the soil. Um, and there, there's the lawn after, after rolling, you can still see all the buffalo grass seed. He went a little heavy, but that's okay. Um, and then started, uh, started watering. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see little tiny bits of green coming up here, and then you can see the weeds coming up too. So he did buy the herbicides that I'll be talking about in a second here. Uh, he did buy those to treat the weeds as they came up into the lawn. And you can see the lawn is pretty much weed free because he followed the instructions. It's about six weeks after he was like texting me pictures every other day of his lawn. He was so proud of this thing. Um, and there, here it is at the, kind of the end of the summer and then into fall is buffalo grass lawn from bluegrass to buffalo grass. Um, you know, took him three to four months, um, but he followed instructions and he got a very nice lawn um, out of this. Then he, he did this in an HOA. So he had to, you know, write letters explaining what he was doing, but, uh, you know, provided the documentation, the HOA, and they were just fine with with what happened. They just wanted to know what he was doing. Here's another example of one. Here's, believe it or not, this person did not like their lawn. They wanted to change to something else. So this was a, this was a tall fescue lawn um, and they wanted to convert this to bluegrass, Kentucky bluegrass, because they wanted to mow it shorter. Now I never would have recommended, oops, sorry, stupid phone. Somebody calling about their lawn probably. Um, any case, uh, so here's the lawn after they sprayed it with uh, Roundup. And he did, I think he did three applications. Again, tall fescue is really hard to kill with Roundup, by the way. Um, and there it is dead. So now instead of removing this and plowing it up and stirring up a bunch of seed, here's what you do is you, you scarify, you put slits into the surface of that lawn. And you can do this with... Um, machines that are specially designed to do this, or you can rent these um, um, uh, from a rental places. These are often called dethatching machines. Um, and this is actually an overseeding machine. So what this thing is doing, there, there's a little seed hopper right here on the front of this. It drops seed onto the lawn, and then this the, the blades make the slits and it drives the seed into the uh, into the uh, uh, soil, um, or so. So that's kind of how it does. There are other versions where 
the slits are made and the cedar is in the back of this and it and then it's, it drops a seed into the slits and that's what i would prefer that's what i think is a better way of doing this but uh, this this way works fine too um went in a couple different directions and actually a diamond pattern works best this is like 90 degree angle but if you if you do kind of a diamond a pattern you actually you get much better uh, coverage um, and so I went over the lawn twice split the seed in half so um, uh, but the, but the idea is to get the seed down into the slits okay the, the other thing he did here is after they got the turf all um, killed with the roundup mowed it as short as the mower would go so you want to take all that dead grass off so you can really get these slits and get the seed down in there some of the seed falls in between and falls on here. So raking it afterwards can help get the seed into the slits. Uh, so you can buy, the, you can rent these. Well, you could buy one. I wouldn't buy one, they're expensive. But you can rent these. And I took these off of the internet last night. So this is the, the latest pricing. Um, so you can go to Home Depot and get the pretty much a version of what I just showed you in this picture. So here's the cedar in the front. And uh, so you can rent this for 60 bucks for four hours or 80 bucks for a day. Uh, and, uh, and so you can put the seed in, but you would do this after you've killed that lawn off. Okay. Um, another way to do this, and quite frankly, which can actually be more successful is when you kill the lawn, leave the lawn in place, but then aerify it um, and making lots and lots and lots and lots of holes. Um, and what falls into the hole, and then, then you see it afterwards. And what you could do is you could do this and then rent this machine. And that's kind of the Cadillac way of doing it. So Aerify, rent this machine, seed it in a couple of different directions. What you're gonna see is you're gonna get a lot of seed coming up out of the holes. Um, that's where it grows best. Just another picture. So you can see the more holes you have, the better. You want all those holes all over the place so that when the grass starts growing, um, it, um, uh, it's very close together. So what's the advantage of doing this versus removing the lawn? You're not stirring up a lot of weed seed. You're stirring up a little weed seed, but not as much as if you tilled it um, and, and, and stirred up all that weed seed. So you get a lot fewer weeds. Uh, the dead turf acts as a mulch, so you don't have to water as much. Nice thing about using these the aerifier for the holes is the grass plants are protected by growing in the holes. So you can actually walk on this lawn and use it while the grass is coming up. You can still let your dog out onto the lawn using this technique or using the slit seeding technique because the grass is being protected by being down in the slits or in those holes, okay? And then here's actually this person's lawn. Um, you know, so it works, it works, um, amazing. So those are different ways. Um, so how do you kill the lawn? Again, Roundup, um, you know, people like to use horticultural vinegar. It's absurdly expensive. You have to apply that stuff probably five or six times to kill the lawn. Um, and in, in the end, it's gonna cost you, with, with three applications, probably $100 per thousand square feet to use versus Roundup, which is $1.70 per square feet, a thousand square feet. Um, so even, and that's for two applications. So it's a way more cost effective. It works better and it's a whole lot safer. Horticultural vinegar is super dangerous to use. The other way you could solarize, this is gonna basically take you all summer. So you're not gonna be seeding and probably till late in you know, July, early August, uh, but it is a way to kill the lawn without using Roundup. So solarization is a potential way to do this. Okay, so then it comes to planting. So here's planting buffalo grass into the dead lawn. So you don't have to seed. You could, if you want to do buffalo grass or Bermuda grass, you could see, you could plug into that dead turf or you can plug into bare soil. Um, you know, so you can use tricks like using a, an auger to drill the hole to uh, plant your plugs. Um, so here's just some pictures of of, of planting and how it progresses from bare soil to they grow together and then you finally have that uh, that lawn covered with the buffalo grass plugs. The Bermuda grass would do the same thing. If you planted that dog tuff, the same thing's going to happen. Um, 
So here, again, here's just pictures. I'm going to zip through these just because of time. But you can see how within 12 weeks of planting plugs, um, you've got a buffalo grass lawn. That's planting those plugs 12 inches apart. So what we call 12 inch centers. Now, if you've got any kind of bare soil, you're going to have weeds. So if you're seeding, plugging, sprigging, buffalo grass or uh, any kind of grass, um, you're going to have weeds. Mother nature and bare soil and water equals weeds. That's a constant combination here. So you're going to need to use some herbicides. And these are your three best friend herbicides, all very safe to use, all very readily acceptable, uh, accessible. You can buy these on Amazon. Uh, you can buy them. Uh, there's another uh, website called Do My Own, Do My Own .com, and you can get these uh, on, on that website. You don't have to have a special license uh, to apply. You just follow the instructions. Um, the key thing is they're all very safe for seedling grass for young grass, and in fact, you can you can apply these at the same time that you seed or put plugs down. They're so safe for the new grass. Um, so one of them is uh, there's homeowner formulation. Scott sells this one called Tenacity. You can put this down the same day that you seed your buffalo grass or seed your blue grama or seed your tall fescue, whatever you're seeding, or seed your bluegrass. Um, it will let the grass come up, but it will control the weeds. It's like a miracle product. Um, so Scott sells it on fertilizer or you can buy it where you spray it. Um, but you need a pretty good sprayer and you need good spray technique. So the, the Scott stuff, uh, the technique, it's fertilizer with the, with the, uh, the herbicide is a really handy way of applying that for new seed or new plugs. Um, a couple other things that are very, very useful are, is one called Quicksilver, very spendy, very expensive little, little bottle. Um, just a few ounces is going to cost you 160 bucks but you use basically an eyedropper, put it in your sprayer. This controls the broadleaf weeds in your lawn, the purslane, the spurge, those kind of things coming up. Then this stuff called quinclorac controls the grassy weeds like crabgrass and barnyard grass that come up in that new seeding or in those plugs. So, so those are your, uh, your best friends for this new lawn that you're gonna be um, uh, starting, whether you're doing it from plugs, doing it from seed, uh, maybe doing it from sprigs. Uh, you know, the, the, this, this term sprigs, this is how uh, Bermuda grass is routinely planted in, in the Southern part of the United States, either by, usually by sod or by sprigs. And sprigs is simply a sod that's been chopped up into little tiny pieces and it's kind of seeded into a lawn. So we might start seeing some of that happening here in Colorado uh, in the next few years as we see more Bermuda grass being grown by some of our sod growers. Okay, so then you get your lawn up. Here's the key, is you use the best management practices for that species. So if you get your buffalo grass lawn up, but you, you keep watering it like your old bluegrass lawn, you're not using best management practices. So the whole goal should be, I'm changing from this grass to this grass for a certain reason. I, I, I don't wanna water as much. I don't wanna mow as much. I want a native lawn, um, whatever the case might be, whatever the reason is. Um, whatever grass you're switching to, read about that grass, learn about that grass, learn when is the best time to fertilize it. This is the best time to fertilize in the summer, like buffalo grass, and the worst time to fertilize buffalo grass is in the spring or the fall, or vice versa for, for bluegrass. You wanna fertilize it like in, in late summer, early fall, and maybe a little bit in the spring. So learn what that, learn what that grass needs. And most importantly, irrigate it appropriately, if, especially if your goal is to use less water. It doesn't make sense to water a more drought resistant lawn the same way you were watering your bluegrass lawn. So 